Thank you for joining us, and thank you to all the candidates. And on the federal order, we have Dave Nyan, Gary Yonker, Gracia Guzman, and Natalie Toro. And of course, shout out to the partner organizations and volunteers and leaders who make this possible. Communities United. Senator, I'm going to build more pantries, 
grocery stores, and in urban gardens. Because if you're getting more healthy food, you're gonna live a healthier and longer life. I've been doing the work of our elected leaders for years. As a private citizen, I've been passing legislation. My hunger bill is gonna create 200 million new meals. I've written a, a constitutional amendment protecting women's reproductive freedoms. And my Funeral and Burial Assistance Act has helped families who have lost their kids. <laughs> That's the type of leader I am. That's the type of service you're gonna get from me. I put people first. Thank you, I look forward to participating in the program today.
be sharing the themes that we're going to be covering today, and we're starting with uh, at-will employment, immigrant workers' rights, domestic violence survivor support, reducing barriers to recovery and supporting addiction, affordable housing, immigrant health care, language access, supporting newly arrived families, the child tax credit, and the guaranteed income program. Yeah. 
just cause laws to stop firearms without warning or good cause. In Illinois, Senator Villanueva has proposed SB 291 in 2023, the Secure Jobs Act, which is a just cause law. On my first day in office, I will co-sponsor this bill because we need just cause laws in Illinois. We have to promote economic security. We have to have stability for our Illinois workers and their families. Thank you. Well, thanks again for your question. Um, I would absolutely support the, the, the bill, the, the Secure Jobs Act, it's, that's from the General Assembly right now. Uh, I, look, we've all been fired from jobs that, that, that uh, the, the, the circumstances weren't there that we should have been let go. So we've all felt that before. Uh, we not only have, we have to have jobs where workers are more secure, we need to have jobs where people get paid more, quite frankly. I got a site also that we're in the school named after Teddy Roosevelt, uh, a progressive Republican president uh, from about 100 years ago that busted up large corporations here in this country and, and put power back into the hands of workers. That's what we need in the state of Illinois. We need to have politicians that put the hands back into the hands of workers, make sure people get fa paid fairly, make sure people get the benefits they deserve, and make sure that they, if they are let go, they, they are let go with just cause. Por 
temor a su estatus migratorio. Se ha divulgado a las autoridades federales. Muchos de los trabajadores indocumentados optan por permanecer callados ante las agresiones sexuales, acosos, robos de salario y otras violaciones en lugar de trabajo cuando los empleadores amenazan con informar a sus, a, a sus trabajadores por su estatus migratorio a las autoridades. ¿Qué iniciativa? Mi pregunta es para todos ustedes. ¿Qué iniciativa política apoyaría usted para proteger a la comunidad de clase trabajadora de Linos, que de, que de Linos de tener que vivir sin miedo? Necesitamos saber qué pueden hacer ustedes para que nuestras comunidades vivan sin miedo. Esa es mi pregunta. story, um, we, first of all, uh, we need to protect all workers regardless of what their, uh, their, uh, their, of their immigration status. Uh, but obviously there are some unique uh, challenges for, for those that, that are not here. Uh, I think, you know, one of, the, one of the things we have to make sure is that, that we stick to the uh, Illinois, the Illinois Great Forward Act of 2021 that said that, that Illinois was going to be a sanctuary state. Uh, and, to, and to not coordinate with, with federal authorities uh, when it came to immigration status. So we need to support the Illinois uh, Way Forward Act that was passed. Uh, we need to support Chicago status as a, as a sanctuary city. Um, and then we also support, need to support initiatives like the One Fair Wage Act that made sure that, that people who were working in the service industry weren't, uh, had, had the rights and the benefits and the wages that they deserve also. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity now also to, to expand one fair wage to a statewide to make sure that there aren't, uh, there, there, that we can do away with the subminimum wage statewide also uh, to try to help uh, not only immigrant families and, 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 and those uh, workers that, that, um, that are undocumented, but to make sure that we can benefit people all, all across the state of working in these industries. So thanks again for your story and your question.
comfortable. Um, and that we can also continue to secure and live a safe haven for all of our uh, people in our state, regardless of whether they're employed or not. Thank you.
what financial support could look like for the 988 crisis line, for rapid support on the ground, because ultimately, if we have a strong, well-funded um, legislative environment for mental health, we can all thrive, and we need to see our providers be able to be supported as well. Thank you.
gender of the people in our meeting is, and today I want to share a personal story that highlights the urgent need for reform, for reform in our approach to drug protection offenses. Uh, back when I was 12 years old, I always lived with my grandma because my mom was unable to take care of us to cure her drug addictions. Um, despite her struggles, I had nothing but good things to say about my mom. Um, I had nothing but good memories with her. Um, however, due to the lack of help and support for her problems, she faced discrimination due to her due to the stigma attached to drug use and criminalization instead of receiving the assistance she needed. Um, unfortunately, I lost her on my first day of seventh grade due to an overdose. Um, I do not stand alone. Uh, professionally, I work with young people through Communities United, and I see young people and families continue to lose their loved ones due to this public health issue. For years, advocates in Illinois have been pushing for a change in the law, advocate, advocating for the reclassification of small-scale drug possession to a public felony to a class A misdemeanor. They argue that instead of bur burdening individuals with incarceration and felony records, we should focus our resources on improving access to service for people struggling with mental health issues and substance use disorders, especially those at greater, greater risk of overdose. I stand here today to urge you, as elected officials, to consider not only the reduction of penalty, uh, but also the, the implementation of comprehensive medical and rehabilitation support for individuals with drug issues. So I would like to ask each of you, if elected, would you support the efforts to end felony guilty for low-level drug possession in Illinois and ensure that approach for a comprehensive medical rehabilitation support for every individual struggling with drug issues?
taking a lifetime of opportunity away from them because somebody makes one mistake. Uh, look, we need to be going after, uh, you know, real problems in this state when we're talking about you know, people who are bringing illegal guns into the state, people who are bringing fentanyl into the state, and we need to, like, take that burden away from the criminal justice system also. Concentrate on the real problems, take away the felony convictions for, uh, for, uh, for, for, for small drug possession and just making them last name
with more funding from the state of Illinois. When's the last time that we built more sub subsidized housing in this city? It's been way too long. We can also then create programs where small owners, small individual property owners can receive low interest loans from the state of Illinois to be able to rehab properties and bring new property, uh, old properties back online, create additional dwelling units. And then, and then and in return for that, we can do a pilot rent control program for these property owners too, since they're receiving these funds from the state of Illinois. Affordability is one of the issues of our, of, of our candidacy. Please check out our uh, campaign at uh, GaryRiver20.com to learn more. Just, uh, just to remind you, we, could, uh, we could slow our pace as we want those kinds of developments. Uh, our interpreters uh, are struggling with it. Thank you. Um, thinking specifically about two to four units, they're the largest source of unsubsidized, naturally occurring housing. We've got 80,000 units um, here in the city. Um, and I think of them and value them as not just a source of affordable rent, but I think a true gift is that we can have intergenerational families living within them, right? That's a beautiful thing. Um, so thinking about things that we tried and tested in our 20th District State Office, which I was proudly the chief of staff in a previous administration to Dr. Kristen Nettles and Isaias, uh, we were able to give the Here to Stay Land Trust Coalition $5 million to start basically
know there's been some, there was some discussion on the state about the, the cost of such programs, but um, thankfully, Governor Pritzker and the state legislature did find the funding there, so we need to make sure that these, both these programs are fully funded uh, moving forward. And then, you know, I believe that healthcare is a human right. We need to keep fighting on a, a state level and a federal level to keep expanding um, the access to healthcare. So one day that we can finally get to a, to a day that, that everybody in this country is uh, is, is afforded the same uh, rights and benefits and coverage, but uh, we can still like support the programs and fully fund the programs that we have here in the state of Illinois uh, that give people the coverage regardless of their immigration status. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. And this is the life's work for a reason. I told you about ideas my grandfather, but it's really written with like the thousands of folks that I've been privileged to work with from the direct service that I've done. You're seeing the Medicaid piece, but there's a whole vision that involves the private market and how we produce equity for the entire state, right? So that's a, a dream left unrealized, but the pathway is there. And I say that to say that for everything we've got left to go, there's some immediate action we need to take. Co-pays have been applied to this program. Those hurt people. Um, there's been cuts to the program. We're not talking about long-term care and nursing. I'd like to see that on the table. But first and foremost, we also have to continue to strengthen our system. There's all kinds more folks with acute medical need, our asylum seekers being a, a dire population that has come with just extreme situations I've seen in police stations. So all in all, you have my commitment to continue the work that I get started. Thank you. Thank you. 
question regarding the newly arrived family support, and to ask, to ask that question will be Esmeralda Lopez. Thank you. 
Um, but I think it also elucidates all of the research and structuring that we have to do all over the place. And so I often talk about the pre-existing housing crisis, and um, this isn't a new crisis, right? This is just one more addition to what we have to solve for. It's why I'm really proud to support the efforts around Bring Chicago Home here in the city perspective. <laughs> low and mid income folks that are paying a higher percentage right now in terms of their income than 
people that are wealthier, we can tackle that. Um, this help would also generate, to the point earlier, um, almost a billion dollars or more in revenue that could be used to the state. And so in terms of tools and assets that our community need, it is absolutely more tangible money that allows them to put it to the places that they need it. And what we learned from UBI and other resources, it's usually housing, it's usually food, it's poor needs, so let's get our families to
reduces income and wealth in Guam. Times are tough for everybody in our state. As I mentioned before, the dollar is not going far enough as it once was. Wages are not catching up to the rising cost of goods and services. 500 bucks a month for UBI is not enough. We need to raise that to $1,000 a month to all families. And you don't need eligibility or reporting requirements either. How are we gonna fund this? We're gonna fund it through a progressive tax. Thank you very much.
So I say that humbly because the woman that has fought for you and your community, that has fought for my family, that has fought for my goddaughter, Elila, who I know is bored as hell, and I think I'm going to be here, is going to fight like half for you in Springfield because that's the kind of tenaciousness of spirit, of community of preparation that we deserve. Values matter, and my commitment has been clear. I will take money from developers. I will take money from corporate interests. For more information, 